Good morning. I want to thank you all for being here, worshiping with us. Today's kind of a, a weird day for me. Normally, I'm all alone up here in this corner. And first service, I came in, and there was a family sitting in the second row. I thought, oh, my. And then I came here, and then these boys are up here. I'm like, what's going on? Who's putting people up to sitting in the front? And whoever it is, good job, because I've been trying for years, and it didn't work. Um, so awesome, awesome. I, I like having people near me when I preach. I promise not to spit on you. Um, <laughs> You laugh, you don't know because you've not been up here. Um, so for the last couple of weeks, we've taken some time and looked at the mission and the vision of our church uh, just to kind of get us all on the same page looking forward, where we're headed, what we're about, what God has called us to do. And so this morning we start a new series. It's going to be six weeks in the book of Haggai. And I don't know if you've ever read the book of Haggai. Rather, maybe you did it when you were going through the Bible in a year. And it's, I mean, it's, it's only two chapters. Um, it's, it's tiny. It's tucked in the prophets. And, and maybe you just kind of didn't really glance at it other than just to check those boxes on your reading plan. But we're going to spend some time here and look at the message that Haggai brings to the Israelite people and really how we can apply it in our lives. And so when we, when we get to this book, it's actually the story of God's people. And in many ways, it's the sta- same story that we see of God's people throughout Scripture. See, God has designed us, he's designed the world to work in a very specific way. Um, and and when, people, uh, when the people of God disobey him, when we're disobedient by sinning, humanity is not able to flourish as God intends us to. And so lack of human flourishing can be made right if the people will repent and then obey and follow him. The prophet then, this, 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 this man Haggai, he is God's good gift to the people. He, he's calling them to repentance. He's calling them to obedience. He's sharing with them the hope of God's blessing. Now, the book of Haggai is a little bit of an, of an anomaly in the Old Testament, particularly among the prophetic books. A lot of times when we read about the prophets, the prophets bring a word. They, they try to correct the people, direct them towards repentance. And what is the response of Israel? Oh, no, we're fine. We'll just go on sinning. This is one of the times where we actually see the people respond in repentance and turn to obedience. And so it's kind of an outlier out there, which is, which is sad that that's how it is, but think about your life, hmm. right? We got to make this personal a little bit. Um, within the books of the prophets, like I said, most decry disobedience, and most of the time we don't see them come to, to, to repentance. We don't see them change their ways. And so Haggai kind of stands out as this encouraging light, an example of what can happen uh, when God's people listen to God's word, delivered through God's prophet, and experience God's blessing. We, we don't know a whole lot about Haggai. Um, we can kind of pick up a few things when we look at the text surrounding his, his book. He was probably an older man, kind of uh, in his 70s maybe. Uh, chapter 2, verse 3 of his book indicates that he might have seen the original temple. Um, he might have uh, walked by it, looked at it, been around it, which would have given him some understanding of the significant of God, significance of God's call um, to rebuild the temple as well as the value of the temple. He would have understood the importance of the land and the centrality of worship uh, that were vital to the flourishing of God's people. He had designed it this way for a purpose. It was to bring him glory, and if they were obedient in that, it would be a blessing, and they, they, would, they would thrive. And so he was aware of all these things, and so that surely lends some weight to God's message as, as Haggai would plead with the Israelite people to abandon their apathy and, and, and take up once again the work of rebuilding the temple. As for where this kind of falls in the timeline of things, the kind of date of where it is, we know that Haggai was part of this returning remnant that was being brought back to Jerusalem after King Darius's decree in 538. Um, After living for years in captivity, the return of their land must have been quite uh, energizing for the Israelite people. Here, Here they've wandered and wandered, and now they have a place. The Persian government rules over the people of Israel. After approximately 50,000 Israelites returned home, there was this urgent concern for the temple and immediate efforts to rebuild it. They they finally get a place, and they know they've got to build God's temple. They know that that's a priority. We've got to get the temple back up. And so the foundation happens real quick. They, They get on it, they get it set, and the foundation is there. 
And the people of Israel, because they've completed phase one, they're like, let's have a celebration. Let's, let's rejoice in what's happened here. Let's, let's, let's just have a good time, right? An all-out party because we've built this, this foundation that the temple's going to stand on. However, because of the success of their building, their, their neighbors, the Samaritans, they didn't like this. They were getting a little nervous. And so they start to, to scheme to slow down their work. They want to they stop the progress. And they're successful in this. They, 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 they get their way. They succeed in part by they appeal to the, the governing authorities. They, the, the project then is just dormant for 16 years. They go, from, they go from arriving in their land and all this excitement to build. And they get part of it done. And then they just stop. They go no further. For two years after Darius became king of the Persian Empire, and that's where, that, that, that's where uh, they start. Haggai begins to prophesy among the people of God. He pleads with them to get over their apathy and, and, so, and to delay their obedience no longer. He says, it's time. We've got to do this. And so this morning we start this series, we're going to see how it plays out for them. We're going to see how we can apply these, these principles in our lives. And so let's go ahead and start reading in chapter one of Haggai. We're going to read the first four verses this morning. And here's what it says. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. The Lord of armies says this, these people say the time has not come for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. The word of the Lord came through prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses while the house, while this house lies in ruins? So it's just the start of the book and we hear what, what the people have said, what they're saying, and we hear God's response. We see there's no time wasted in pointing out the people's problem immediately. God says that the, the time for the building of the temple has not come. That's what you say. That, that's your words, that it's just not time for it. But it seems inconsistent with the readiness with which they began the project years ago. Remember how excited they were and they have their place and we've got to build the temple. We've got to get it done. That's kind of faded. They laid the foundation. They, 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 they celebrated in great joy and fanfare. And, and there was some sadness in this, this celebration as well. And, and maybe that overshadowed things. These people, the, the elders in the, in the community had seen the old temple and its splendor. They'd seen what the, Sol, the, the temple of Solomon was and, and they'd seen it with their own eyes and, and it maybe dampened the enthusiasm and that kind of won the day and, and it slowed their plans. And then you add in the Samaritans saying, we've got to stop this. And then they're successful in, in helping them completely forget that we've got to do this. They get them distracted a little bit and they don't accomplish it. Whatever, whatever their rationale is for stopping, the Lord challenges it by throwing back at them their own words. And it's a rhetorical question, but he, he says, how can it not be the time to build my temple, but you've got time to build your homes. You've got time to construct your city You've got time to do what you want to do, but it's not time to build my temple. There seems to be no comparison between their homes in exile and, and the homes they've now built, right? They, 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 they've, they've constructed this, this, their homes, the, the businesses, they're, they're really picking up that task. So what explains the success of building their homes and the failure to build God's temple? What happened? What we come to see here is this group has chosen, they're going to postpone their obedience. And the truth of the matter is this, when we postpone obedience, it's equivalent to just having a sinful heart. We have this, this sinful heart in us because we, we don't, here, here's the thing, Haggai was concerned for the Israelite people. Haggai is there because he, is, he wants them to hear the word of the Lord. He wants them to repent. He wants them to respond. And, and he's there because he's concerned for them. They had returned home over 16 years earlier, but they had made such little progress on this temple. And, and the initial return caused the excitement. You could probably assume maybe euphoria for many of these Jewish people, finally having a place. The excitement leads them to, to fervently rebuild the foundation you ever started a great project? I told you about my porch, right, where I stenciled the porch. 
And the first day I did this, I was like, this will be great. And I got about three rows in. I was like, this is dumb. I finished it this weekend. It's beautiful. I don't even care how it looks. It's done, right? It, you get that way, though. I was like, I, I, you can only stencil things and do this motion for so long. And I'm like, forget it. I'm tired. But you get worn out. There were other things I had to do, too, like come to work, parent children, take them places. Most of it revolves around them, now that I come to think of it. But, but I was excited to start because I was like, this will be really cool. It'll look really nice. But we get that way, and that's how they were. They were excited. They were ecstatic. They, they, were, they were going in the right direction. However, as is often true with obedience to God's commands, the, the Jewish people were pressured to abandon their task. They decided their neighbors, the, 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 the Samaritans, they, they, they feared, the Samaritans feared a renaissance of, of Jewish power uh, and, and compelled them to abandon the rebuilding of the temple. And so it pays off and they just stop. They, they, they change tasks and they, they look at for these next 16 years, they work on building up the town. They work on building up what they want, the businesses, the, the places for them to gather. And in the midst of, of life being lived, the most important thing was forgotten. Namely, the worship of God. That's what they were missing that's what they had stepped around. And it's, it's, there's a striking similarity to the behavior of Martha in the account that Jesus is at his friend's home. Remember this? Listen to what we read about Martha in Luke chapter 10. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. And she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. And the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice, and it will not be taken away from her. Here Martha is, and she thinks she's doing the number one task, preparing the home, preparing the food, preparing everything for Jesus. And she's upset because Mary's just sitting there. It's not fair. Why should Mary just get to sit while Martha does all the work? And she even tries to get Jesus to school. She's like, Jesus, you see what's happening. I'm doing it all. She's doing nothing. He's like, Martha, you're worried about the wrong things. Quick note to my children. Don't try that with mom. But that's a whole other ballgame. But but she's like, I I, I want help. I need to get my my stuff done before I can sit where Mary is. And he says, no. He goes, there's only one thing that's really important here. Mary's got it. I'm not going to tell her to go away. She was distracted. She was distracted by her desires and and the appearance of of the place she was in. And Mary did the right thing. She sat at Jesus' feet. She's learning from him. She's worshiping him. The Israelite people, they were busy, but they were ultimately busy with their own things. They were apathetic to the worship of God. And and into this picture comes the voice of Haggai. In verse 2, he recounts the Lord's dismay when he says the people of Israel had no interest in rebuilding the temple. He says, these people say, the time has not come for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. You You know what this time has not come is code for? I've got better things to do. They're like, listen, we know we were excited at one point. We stopped, but we've got things we've got to accomplish before we can do that. I've got better things to do. This is not new for the Israelites of Haggai's time. It's not foreign in our day. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of of you have have been asked to serve on a committee or asked to teach a class or asked to do this or that within the church or serve in a ministry? And you're like, well, I can't now. Well, you don't say that. You say, let me pray about it. And then you're like, no, right? But how many of us, how many of us think I've got better things to do? I've, I've got to go about what I need to accomplish, what I've got to get done. Overlooking the things of God in favor of our own things is is fairly commonplace. It's the same thing that we see play out in Genesis chapter 3, where the serpent uh, uh, convinces Eve 
to disregard God's word and believe that her, her own wisdom is sufficient. Go back to Genesis and look what we read about, about Eve. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delight to, a delight to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She, was also, she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And we're not going to play the blame game today, but I am going to say this. Eve was deceived into eating it. Adam, just dumb. <laughs> come on. The serpent's like, hey, Eve, come try this. Adam's, I mean, he's there. And she's like here, and he's like, okay. What else you got? Come on. This, but we know how this plays out. We know where this ends. We know, know the rest of the story. This willingness to postpone obedience or disregard it altogether it's been a marker of the human race ever since Eve's initial transgression. At the root of this sin is the nastiness of pride. The, the belief that our wisdom, that our preferences are greater than his. This is, there was one pastor that wrote this. If he only had one sermon to preach, it would be a sermon against pride. How often does our pride get us in trouble? How often does our pride lead us to postpone obedience? What Haggai wanted for the Israelite people was a changed heart because that would change their behavior. He desired to see them put God above everything else and his commands over all their concerns. This is precisely what Jesus was trying to instill in Martha when he sees her busy working and she forgets the importance to worship him. That's what he's trying to point out to her. There's more important things than what you're doing, what you think needs to happen. This passage reminds us that God's greatest desire is for us, for us is that we honor him and we obey his commands. M much like little children who constantly question their parents at night in an attempt to postpone sleep. You ever put a child to bed? In this day and age, it's not, okay, good night, shut the door and walk out and shut the light off. I don't work. I've raised four. My first one, <laughs> They could just have stories told about them today. My first one, this was, this was great because we learned with her, right? And she needed a drink. Yes, we brought a cup. It was the, we had the two stories in that house, which was beautiful because you could put them upstairs and you could shut the door and have a life downstairs after they were in bed. And you, you put her in bed and she needed a drink. Okay, fine. And just as I'm getting ready to leave, and I probably told this before, she's like, can't I just pray with mommy who's downstairs? not up here where we're at. What am I supposed to say to that? If I say no, I'm a horrible pastor, right? And if I say yes, I'm, I'm not a great dad because she's found a way to get what she wants. It's rough. So I'm like, okay, okay, use that. So then Ava, which I'm convinced my children had all sorts of meetings to prepare each other for the upbringing. Um, putting her to bed one night. And we went through the whole rigmarole. We're all like, okay, it's time for bed. Lay down. She goes, as I'm, I'm getting ready to leave the room, she goes, can't I just read the Bible for five more minutes? <laughs> no. <laughs> You're going to have to postpone your obedience to God for a little bit. I'm sorry. I mean, come on. They were, they were pulling out everything. They knew the regular stuff wasn't going to work, but hey, dad's a pastor. Let's hit on the word. Let's hit on prayer. Surprised it wasn't. Can I call someone and, and just pray with them? A disciple? I want to disciple somebody and do it now, right? <laughs> Goodness. But we do this all the time. At least I do. We, we try we postpone obedience. The, the postponing is rooted in theology and history. And as we understand clearly that humanity is, is inherently sinful and has been, has been since the Garden of Eden. And so we've got to ask ourselves these questions. Are we postponing obedience in our lives? Are we doing that as a church? Whatever he's calling you to, whatever he's calling us to, are we following in it? Or are we saying, wait a minute, we got things to do and then we'll get to it. This is not an easy book to start out. Haggai is not real, real comforting at the start. I promise you it gets really good. But right here, it's hard. 
These are tough questions. These are tough concepts to think about. I want us to ask God to just open our eyes and our hearts to any hint of this so that we can seek to have our hearts changed, so that he is above everything else, so that we are following in obedience as we should. However, they were not just postponing obedience. The Israelites were also choosing comfort over obedience, which, is a mispla- which means misplaced priority. It was about them instead of about God. He continues, Haggai continues by offering this striking commendation of the Israelite people. Keep in mind that at at this point, they were fairly established after their return from exile. They had built up homes. They had built up businesses. They just hadn't built the temple. They were settled into their regular routines in spite of the, the fact that they had abandoned their commitment to the temple of God. And so Haggai starts to speak up in opposition. Don't you love to be the person speaking up in the voice of opposition? Yeah. And here he is. He's saying, guys, you need, you need to reel it in. You need to see what's happening here. He begins by, by decrying their, their paneled houses. Haggai specifically uses this word for paneled that implies, that implies well-appointed or comfortable In other words, they they were not only settled in their homes, they had been out shopping for furniture and and, and decorations. And I mean, they had it all and they were were there. They knew, they, they they, they they were living the life of luxury after being exiled for all these years. And and here's the thing, Haggai's not condemning them for comfortable living, right? He's condemning this living at the expense of obedience to God's command. That's the issue. It's not that they had all these things. It's not that they'd built their homes. It's that they had avoided and, and disrupted and distracted from the main thing. And here they just went on about their way. He specifically contrasts their paneled houses with the temple, which lies there in ruin. These are strong words that are intended to clarify the radical disparity between their own standard of living and the condition of the house of God. They were living in comfort while God's house remained unbuilt and God's will remained undone. It's kind of a a disparity is not uncommon among God's people. Sadly, this commentary rings true in today's world as well. It's it's similar to what the prophet Malachi prophesied in, in, in the final book of the Old Testament. Look at what we read in Malachi 1. A son honors his father and a servant his master, but if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is your fear of me? Says the Lord of armies to you, priests. Who despise my name. Yet you ask, how have we despised your name? By presenting defiled food on my altar. How have we defiled you, you ask, when you say, the Lord's table is contemptible? Like these priests, the Israelites were authentically more interested in what they can gain than they were in obeying God's commands. Again, that's an attitude we can see very readily among the church today. We see people placing chief importance on what their faith in God can do for them as opposed to how their faith in God should cause them to serve. And often the chief objection to obeying God's commands is the cost involved in doing so. Yet we have no reason to be shocked by the cost, right? It wasn't like Jesus hid what the cost was. He was very forthcoming with what it would cost to follow him like we're supposed to. He, he clarifies it for us that the cost of following him is significant. Go into Luke chapter 9. He says to them all, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross. Follow me. I, sometimes I think it may be lost in translation to how this looks, what it means, but basically it's not about us. I've said it over and over. The life of a Christ follower is not one of ease. It's not one of comfort. We're called to die daily. We're we're called to follow him and his will over what we want and what we desire. It's about him. The Israelite people had an obedience issue, but Haggai understood that this was really an issue of the heart. That's what it boiled down to. It was a heart problem. And he thought, He thought if their hearts were warm toward God, their behavior would follow. If they could gain the proper perspective and follow as they were commanded to, change would occur. 
They were disobedient because they had chosen to love themselves more than they loved God. Ultimately, it's an example of idol worship, but, but at the center of the worship, their worship was themselves. Sometimes we think of idol worship and we think about things that we worship or, or objects, but, but the reality is self can be one of the biggest idols we, we have to fight because it's all about me and I like me and I want me to do well. But the reality is, is I'm God's. I'm his. They were in subtle ways mimicking this kind of worship that, that this American writer, David Foster Wallace, once described in a commencement speech. Listen, listen to what he said. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God to worship is that pretty much everything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you'll die a million deaths before your loved ones finally plant you. Worship power and you'll end up feeling weak and afraid and you'll need ever more power over others to numb your own fear. Worship your intellect. Being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. Look, the insidious thing about these forms of worship is not that they're evil or sinful, it's that they're unconscious. They're default settings. I mean, we're wired. We're wired against Him. Our heart's not bent towards Him. Until we experience that salvation, until we've come to him. And then it's a battle. It's a battle. And I'd like to say, you know, obedience to him once you've received, it's easy. It's not. But he's given us his spirit. He's given us this gift that can help us in this path. that That can guide us into obedience The danger for the Israelite people wasn't that they had abandoned building the temple. It was that they had abandoned God. They weren't weren't about worship of him. Their comfort rose in importance. Their their fear of the Samaritans, it was was greater than their fear of God. And they succumbed to the pressure of self-preservation. Sadly, as Haggai would go on to point out, their their attempts at self-preservation or human flourishing would backfire. What what they believed to be critical to the advancement of their comfort actually accomplished the exact opposite. They desired to flourish, and instead, they were failing. And it was all because they rejected God as the primary object of their worship. I don't know if I mentioned this, but this is not a lighthearted book to start. There's, There's a lot to unpack. There's a lot that we need to look at personally. There's a lot we need to look at as a church and say, is any of this occurring in our lives? Is any of this occurring in our worship? There's some heavy stuff to work through as we get to the end, as we move through these, these, these two chapters. Haggai can cause us to examine ourselves Our church makes certain that we're not following these these footsteps of the Israelites and saying, yeah, we'll do it, but we'll do it in our time. Yeah, we'll do it, but we're busy with other things. One of the things I hate to hear my children say, and they know this, is when I ask them to do something, they're like, in a second, right? How many of you know that in a second means not for at least three days, right? I mean, come on. That's what we do, though. God calls us to something. He, he directs us in a way and we're like, eh, in a second, I'll get there. I'll do it, but, but I need to do these things first. There's hope though, right? It, uh, it's heavy. I, I get that this is, and, and it's something we need to wrestle with, but it's not the end. We don't have to leave here going, well, that's just depressing. It's hard. But if this can cause us to come back, if this can cause us to to see the need for repentance and obedience in our lives and and our life as a church, imagine the blessing that can come through that. Imagine what can happen when we turn our hearts toward God. Haggai was the one prophet they listened to. It ends well. They come, the Israelites turn back towards God. 
But as we start out this, this study, we've, we've just finished looking at our mission and vision, and now we have to start asking some hard questions. Are we following God in obedience with our lives? Are we following God in obedience with our church? Are we choosing comfort over obedience when it comes to living out our faith? See, if we're on the wrong path, we, if we're choosing self over God, we need to address why we're doing that. What's happening to cause us to do that? If we're choosing anything over God, it's time for us to come together and repent. It's time for us to, 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 to turn back towards him and away from whatever's taken his place. It's time to seek to be obedient to his call on our lives and his call on Smith Grove. It's time to get to the heart of the issue. And that may be causing us to postpone obedience and and choose comfort. But it's time to turn from those and go back to worshiping him above all else, humbling self to repent and obey. They're not easy actions. They're not not easy things to, to, to walk through. But if we can, if we can do it together, it strengthens that bond between us. It puts us on the path that he's got us on. Like I said, this is not easy stuff. But it's stuff we have to talk about. It's things we need to consider. And, and I know I'm up here saying this to you, but I'm, I'm struggling with Haggai. I told first service, I'm excited about it, I think, but I'm also scared because a lot of this starts with me. It starts with us as individuals because if, if we as, as a church are full of individuals that are going about their own thing, doing their, their own way, we've got a problem. But if we can come together, if we are all seeking Him in our personal lives, it's going to reveal itself here. So as we get ready to move to a time of response, we're going to respond through song in a moment, but I'm going to ask Sessa if he'll come and just play some music for a few minutes. And, and I'm going to do another one of those big asks where if, if you want to come, not if you want to come, we got to get outside our comfort zones. It's uncomfortable to come up here and pray together as a church. Let's just be real. It makes us nervous. We get a little iffy. But if you want to be on this path that God, I think, setting up for us. It starts here. It starts with humbling ourselves before Him, asking Him to unveil our eyes to any sin, any unrepentant sin in our lives, any of those issues we're dealing with that that take precedent above Him. And so I'm going to ask you to come up here and join me. You can sit in these front pews. If you can't kneel, you can kneel up here at these stairs. But let's pray together for each other, for our church, and for ourselves. Like I said, it's, it's not fun, but this is where we start. It's time to humble ourselves. It's time to say, God, you above all else in everything. We know what he's called us to do. We're getting ready to say it here in a few minutes. We're going to say the Great Commission. We know that's what we're to be about. But it doesn't say go when you're not distracted. It doesn't say go when you have nothing else to do. He just says Go. So these next few weeks, they're, they're going to be, it's going to be good for us. I, I firmly believe that. But let's get through this first week. Let's get back to, to what he's called us to, where he's the object of our worship, where he's the object of our lives, where it's all about him and not about us. So I'm going to offer a word of prayer, and then we're just going to open this up here just to come and pray together. See that you're not by yourself in this. Sometimes I think we're, we, we, we feel like we're an island all by ourselves in our faith, and that's the furthest thing it should be. It should be a community. We're all broken. We're all messed up. We all have our issues. We all are not, we're not going to do this perfectly, but we might as well not do it by ourselves. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm just going to open it up, and I invite you to come, and let's start out on this journey through Haggai together. Father God, once again, I thank you for this this time to present your word. I thank you for this little book in the the middle of these prophets that, Father, reveals what happens when we listen to the messenger, when we listen to your word. So, Father, give us a heart to follow you, to serve you, 
to be obedient to the call that you've placed on us. God, we've got some business to do with you personally as a church as well. And so, Father, I pray that you guide us in that. That, Father, we would, we would come to see that, that your way is way above anything that we can think of. And that, Father, if we'll just submit, if we'll just follow, it'll be all the better. We'll see your blessing more and more. So, God, as we take this moment to come before you, to lay things down, to humble ourselves, to prepare our hearts, I pray, God, that you would guide us into that and that through it, you would be glorified. So, God, thank you for this time where we can respond as brothers and sisters in Christ as a church. And, Father, help us to have that spirit leading us in this. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.